Research Seminar. We're delighted to have um, one of our own faculty giving uh, the seminar today. Allison Trope doesn't need any introduction to anyone here. She's been a clinic, she is a clinical associate professor and has been here for eight, nine years? Ten. Ten, ten years now. Great. We should, we should have you talk just to celebrate that. Uh, Allison uh, did her degree in uh, critical studies at the uh, USC Cinema School here in 1999. You did some work in the industry for a while. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And today we're here celebrating the publication of her new book, Stardust Monuments, Hollywood and the Power of Place, which was published just uh, a couple months ago uh, by Dark Dartmouth Press. So we're delighted to have you here and to share your ideas about the new book. And we're looking forward to hear what you have to say. to uh, present this, as, as I was telling Peter, it's been a long haul getting this book out. Uh, I want to begin today with something that happened fairly recently. Uh, a Diet Coke ad that aired on this year's Academy Awards. And I'm going to show that and I'll just talk about it a little bit briefly afterwards. Hollywood, 
offering the public the opportunity to see, consume, and memorialize it. Such examples, I'd say, anchor Hollywood in what has been called a usable past. And while movies themselves may serve as anchors, they don't always capture the full scope of Hollywood's story or this usable past. In addition to films, then, these concrete material artifacts have played and continue to play a key role in shaping what Hollywood is and what it means. Indeed, they transform Hollywood as an industry and material product into an idea, a narrative, or, as I said before, a state of mind. Early on, industry leaders, as well as fringe figures trying to make their mark, developed a highly set uh, or a highly visible set of Hollywood signs and stories to evoke, commemorate, and capitalize on Hollywood's symbolic value. The gala premiere, the movie star, footprints at Roman's Chinese Theater, the Hollywood Walk of Fame, the Hollywood sign, the movie struck girl, the discovery at Schwab's drugstore, all of these things came to stand in for Hollywood and connote a range of other experiences and symbols, glamour, celebrity, opportunity, fame and fortune, fantasy, magic, spectacle, and that love of being at the movies. <coughs> Clearly, watching, the move, watching movies then embodies only one kind of Hollywood experience and only one breeding for crown for Hollywood's cultural work. Throughout the book, I examine signs and sites, including museums, theme parks, retail stores, restaurants, classic movie, cable channels, DVDs, and the internet. On their own and in concert with one another, these sites serve historiographical functions. They write Hollywood's history, shedding light on its myriad identities as artifact, art, entertainment, social document, educational tool, memorabilia, merchandise, and object of cultural memory and history. These sites frame Hollywood alternately as pristine celluloid and coveted material artifacts. They invoke an untouchable mystique while revealing the secrets of its backstage regions. They educate and elucidate while strategically engrossing the public in their brands. And they satisfy fans, connoisseurs, and consumers while securing the corporate bottom line. In turn, this array of approaches offers insight into the politics of knowledge production within and between these institutions that write Hollywood's history. Story. So going back to that idea of a Hollywood state of mind, I think it's important to consider how that state of mind hovers uneasily between personal subjective experiences, those from fans and consumers, and institutionally constructed messages. In many cases, the feelings of individuals and the meanings generated by institutions are often indistinguishable. They're interchangeable. So this state of mind, in some ways, inevitably reflects the sanctioned meanings constructed and circulated by the industry itself. However, such sanctioned meanings also do not exist in a vacuum, nor are they always identical from one institution to the next, which is something I explore at length in my book. So as I discuss in the book, Hollywood often gets volleyed about within a complex network of cultural and corporate exhibition conventions and priorities, in-house rhetoric, public relations missions, and a volatile landscape of financial and political backing. Founders, trustees, cultural elites, philanthropists, collectors, archivists, corporations, executives, and industry professionals, as well as audiences, fans, and cinephiles, all potentially play a role. Each institution then uses its cultural authority and economic and political clout to construct potentially divergent though often similar, even canonized narratives of Hollywood and its history. For the most part, cultural and commercial values <coughs> seem to seamlessly intertwine in the institutional dynamics of both nonprofit and for-profit institutions, each of which has a stake implicitly or ex explicitly in tying its identity to Hollywood. Over the last decade or so, the stakes may be higher, the need more pressing, to harness this Hollywood state of mind. Technological developments in digital media, declining box office as well as DVD profits, and rising piracy have preoccupied, have precipitated rather, sweeping changes in Hollywood. 
along with fragmented media landscapes, these changes necessitate a careful consideration of the role traditional institutions, as well as ancillary arenas and markets, can serve as monuments to Hollywood. But <coughs> this kind of industrial crisis is not new. Hollywood has been here before. And so it's worth considering how the industry might have sought out external legitimacy to placate itself, particularly in the face of claims that, quote unquote, old Hollywood was disappearing. The instability of the post-World War II period marked by labor strikes, blacklisting, the divestiture of the studios following the 1948 Paramount Decree, as well as competition from television, all played a role in spurring the industry's desire to erect a permanent monument to itself. In the 1950s, a museum seemed a logical and concrete way for Hollywood to foster its self-preservation, survival, and even its mortality. But the question remained, what would such a museum exhibit? Who would back it? How would it navigate its relation to the film industry? And how would it fit into the larger cultural landscape of Los Angeles? As competing visions of Hollywood continue to shape the way we see, perceive, and interpret larger questions about Hollywood's symbolic power, and as Hollywood players often remain reluctant to fund such projects, many of these same questions remain unanswered. While there had been earlier plans to build a mu movie museum in Los Angeles dating back to the 1930s, in fact, there were exhibits at the old, what is now the Natural History Museum, it used to be the Los Angeles Museum. None of these ventures uh, took on the epic scale or garnered the attention received by the County Industry Partnership of the 1950s and 60s. In 1959, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors established a commission and authorized the building and operation of the Hollywood Museum designed to support the entertainment industries. This governmental support from the county was crucial to the museum project, indicating that the industry and the museum project had secured an important political and financial ally, as well as other legal perks, such as rights of condemnation. With this legal leeway, and the legitimacy and authority it offered, the Hollywood Museum planners had the power and influence to act in ways that without the county's help would have been impossible. The most concrete <coughs> manifestation of the museum came in October 1963, some seven years after county supervisor John Anson Ford had first approached actress Mary Pickford, a staunch supporter of all of the earlier museum efforts to set up a planning committee made up of her peers. In this, on this date, October 21, 1963, as many as 7,000 Los Angeles residents, fans, reporters, and celebrities gathered on a four, eight, four and a half acre land parcel on Holland, Highland Boulevard across the street from the Hollywood Bowl to break ground for the museum. Actress Rosalind Russell presided over the ceremony and opened by reading a congratulatory telegram sent by President Kennedy. And I'll read the, this portion of the telegram. Through the motion picture, television, radio, and other recording media, modern technology has added a totally new and exciting dimension to the creative arts. The unique characteristics of these new art forms require special institutions. The new Hollywood Museum can make a major contribution to the educational and cultural resources of this country, and I should like to congratulate its sponsors on undertaking this challenging task. This telegram reflected the Kennedy administration's interest in promoting the arts on a national scale, as well as a more general optimism surrounding the promises of global communication in the 1960s. Aligning the Hollywood Museum's mission alongside the nation's legitimated the institution based on its potential service to a broad-based public, while also ensconcing Hollywood within this larger kind of imaginary community. By interweaving Hollywood culture with American culture, and corporate interests with national interests, the groundbreaking work to reconstitute Hollywood, its products, and the idea of film culture as symbols of civic import. The latent significance of this presidential dedication in turn signaled an important rhetorical moment. Discourse produced by and surrounding the Hollywood Museum Project was steeped in this <coughs> ideology of public service. 
its planners, largely comprised of film industry leaders, did not view the museum's agenda exclusively in terms of disseminating art and cultivating art appreciation. Nor did they single out film scientific and technological history. Rather, the Hollywood Museum planners sought to prove that their museum could do more, be more, and symbolize more than its predecessors. In fact, the museum's very legitimacy depended on proving not only that it has a responsibility to serve the public and the nation at large, but that it could be epic in its proportions. The museum was envisioned as more than a museum, more than a breeding ground for cinephilia, more than a collection of memorabilia, and most importantly, perhaps, more than a monument to the industry, film, stars, and myths that symbolized Hollywood. The conceptual plan for the museum was detailed in a film made by the museum founders in 1964, appropriately titled Concept. <coughs> and here I wanted to show you a brief clip of actor Edward G. Robinson introducing the audience to the, this epic project. How are you doing, ladies and gentlemen? And welcome. In case you're all confused by this beer, allow me to identify myself. I'm Edward G. Robinson, and I'm honored and delighted to have been asked to introduce you to a preview of one of the most exciting show places in the world, soon to be a reality. The Hollywood Museum, the first international center of audio, visual arts and sciences. It is devoted to the present influence, the future advancement, as well as the past accomplishments of the or media of communication, motion pictures, television, radio and recording, and their associated industries. It is a living memorial to these industries, to their inventors and developers, to the creative artists, to all who help man communicate with man through sight and sound. This model, designed by William L. Pereira, and associates shows how the museum will look when completed. This is the educational tower, which will contain extensive research material and facilities for detailed study by the individuals, organizations, and industries who have been responsible for making the lively arts of sight and sound the great influence they are on American and world culture. Here is the four level division, which will house displays, visitor participation shows and exhibits, as well as libraries, theaters, restaurants. And this is the museum's two fully equipped operating sound stages. In comfortable gallery seats, you will watch actual motion pictures or television shows in production. Whether you're a visitor with a few hours to enjoy just the highlights or a serious amateur interested in studying techniques or a researcher benefiting education, business, or other interests, you will gain a deeper understanding of the blending of art, science, and business. This is the International Center for the Communications Industry. Many of us now actively working to complete this exciting project will guide you through the Hollywood Museum. Okay, so this is actually a 55-minute <coughs> promotional film where they walk you through <laughs> in that kind of slow pace of Edward G. Robinson's narration there, um, the, the entire museum uh, plants. I'm going to show you one brief clip again at the end. But clearly, I think we can tell from Robinson's introduction that this museum had grand aims, epic. It was designed to serve this broad spectrum of interests that reflected the grand, multifaceted, not multifaceted and not always unified vision of Hollywood. Fundamentally, though, it had to serve both the public and the industry. So looking at some more slides, I'm just going to show you some of the, the drawings for the proposed museum. In addition to embodying national unity, the museum had to mark itself as an industry sh shrine, upholding the history of Hollywood films, stars, and practitioners. An archive, as Robinson mentioned, to house film and material culture, 
a science and technology showcase to promote experimentation and innovation. This was some sort of sound tunnel that you would walk through. Um, a tourist venue to serve the scores of annual visitors to Los Angeles. This was a restaurant with the King Arthur and Cosba theme going on. Um, a cultural attraction to offer insight into the workings and mystique of Hollywood artifacts. And um, here we have an example of one of the sound stages that he mentioned. And finally, it was also meant to be a storyteller that would perpetuate the mythology of Hollywood glamour. In the eyes of the museum planners, Hollywood had to embody a tangible site-specific identity, a commercial business entity, an imaginary universal symbol, and particularly, as the 1960s approached, a utopian celebration of burgeoning communications technology. The task of encapsulating all of the meanings connoted by Hollywood and its history constituted a significant challenge, as you might imagine. And this was evidenced by the museum venture as well as those that preceded and followed it. From the Museum Commission's first progress report in 1959, veteran Hollywood executive and producer Saul Lesser elided these challenges by stressing the united response of many major creative entities in Hollywood, including the Motion Picture Producers Association, or the Motion Picture Association of America, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, as well as various fields and unions. The report further worked to erase the contradictions and potential conflicts brewing under the surface and assumed that the county and Hollywood's goals were the same. In order to link an industry-specific interest in preservation and immortality to broader civic and even global interests, the museum planners strategically tied their project to Hollywood's place in Americana. And this was helped again by Kennedy's telegram. They positioned Hollywood as a key player in an international industry, as well as an important component of American war, comparable in its status to national parks, other national monuments and treasures, such as Radio City Music Hall. Such comparisons function to legitimate the museum and the city of Los Angeles as a worthy breeding ground for American cultural life. Echoing this unique and commemorative focus on America, California Senator Thomas Kuchel reported to Congress on the museum's establishment in 1961, stressing the institution's representation of national interest as well as its devotion to the American public. Kuchel called the film industry uniquely American while praising it for doing so much to, quote, knit the world closer together. By the early 60s, this vision of knitting the world together was reflected in a reconceived scope of the museum that uh, Robinson mentioned, one that included television, radio, and recording industries under this larger Hollywood umbrella. While this inclusion no doubt reflected fundraising motives to some extent, it nonetheless suggested a rhetorical shift in the museum's institutional mis mission and situated Hollywood in this broader context of science, industry, and communications technology. The shift further paralleled contemporary trends in America's social and political scene tied to the space age and utopian visions of global communication. In turn, the museum offered to contribute to these ideals by not only exhibiting communications technology, but also promising to promote <coughs> progress in communication. The Hollywood Museum poised itself to tell this epic story one that enveloped Hollywood within a larger discourse on human culture and communication. The planners also positioned the museum as a live institution, and we heard Robinson talk about this too. Um, a live institution that would exhibit artifacts and processes, but also present a more interactive picture of the me media's role in this broader context of Hollywood and American culture. The Hollywood Museum plans further echoed theorist André Malraux's uh, conception of a musée imaginaire, or museum without walls, a phrase that, since it was invoked in 1947, had subsequently entered popular discourse. The focus on liveness and dynamism also tapped into a popular conception of contemporary media and technological developments. This notion of live implied being there. And for a museum, it could also imply going behind the scenes, bringing it to the visitor as it really was or is, and making the museum visit experiential. 
the Hollywood Motion Picture and Television Museum took on this connotation of liveness already attached to television and television aesthetics in order to distinguish itself from traditional museums and further to offer the visitor a sense of being part of the film and television production process. In addition to these television references, the connotations of liveness <coughs> in the early 60s were also tied to the burgeoning space race. The museum officials did not lose sight of this connection and in fact exploited it in their design and rhetoric. Comparing early museum documents to those from the mid-60s reveals a distinct shift in tone, paralleling a simultaneous cultural and national shift in attitudes toward media and technology spurred by a number of contemporary social changes. According to one late 1964 document, the challenges of our space age have made it incumbent on all of us individually and collectively to actively support the educational and curatorial needs of the local community and of the nation. Within committee and planning circles, there was much discussion of the need to position the museum in relation to the space age and further to make, take into consideration the far greater and more sweeping needs of a free society. Around the same time, Marshall McLuhan published his famed treatise, Understanding Media. While there's no evidence to suggest that McLuhan's writings directly influenced the museum planners, his work suggests ideas that were circulating within popular discourse at the same historical moment. And so when the Hollywood Museum <coughs> positioned the lively arts of sight and sound as influential on cultures all over the world, the museum in turn positioned Hollywood as the conduit and promoter of a kind of global village, instigating communication and in the most utopian vein, social change. Another document that I quote here from the early 60s further justified the museum's global significance on the level of media <coughs> education. Uh, the document states that the human problem is primarily a problem of communication. Since the beginning of time, man has striven to find new ways to express ideas and to exchange knowledge. knowledge. Through the miracle of invention, communication has been extended by four modern media, cinema, radio, television, and recording. Together with the printed word, they are the most universal and accessible forms of education. To advance science and learning through these four magical media, the Hollywood Museum is irrevocably dedicated. And I'm just going to show you now um, the conclusion of this film concept, uh, which has uh, radio and television personality, Art Linkletter, and Robinson further articulating this global utopian vision. Four communications media circle the world, involved in all human attention. They are used in education, governments, and industry, in all purposes of man. Because these media are still developing, the basic philosophy of the museum will be one of constant change. The museum will be dedicated to keeping pace with the swiftly developing sight and sound arts. Right now, throughout the country, leaders in all phases of television, radio, Recording and motion pictures are planning and preparing displays and living presentations which will reveal the dynamic growth of the four media and give us a deeper understanding of their production and importance. We appreciate this opportunity to introduce you to the Highland Museum. We welcome your interest, your ideas, your participation now to help us make an even greater force in the development of the audiovisual arts and sciences. Again, 
very sweeping, very epic. And I would say again that this, the museum's rhetoric here paralleled McLuhan's sweeping claims about humanity and modern civilization. The museum presented itself as a universal teacher and a communicator in its own right, situating itself not only in this American context, but also this kind of universal, timeless, and <coughs> fundamentally um, human one. The museum planners seem to move further and further away from the everyday workings of Hollywood, as well as its emphasis on industry promotion and preservation. A 1962 report stressed the museum's interest in science in the future, emphasizing that the history of communications technology was an unfinished one. It said that the museum will contain dramatic evidence of the past and present, with major concentration also on the future. It is to be an exposition, which will compare favorably with the great museums of science and industry throughout the world. The exposition analogy, I would argue, is particularly significant. Through it, the report invoked a specific tradition of world expositions as venues for the display of scientific and technological innovation. Specific mention of film, television, or Hollywood, for that matter, is conspicuously absent. Instead, the report framed media within this larger paradigm of communications technologies, arguing that the museum's portrayal of the four industries that we've heard acted as an audiovisual contribution to humanity and human interaction, implicitly equal to, if not more significant, than their contribution on the level of entertainment. The museum showed a definitive interest, therefore, in media as both art and technology, and linked its exhibition of communications technology to a sense of national prosperity and, in turn, a kind of global supremacy. One internal document further suggested that the museum would, quote, aid in maintaining the universal recognition of Hollywood, Los Angeles County, as world capital of the motion picture, television, arts, and industries. In attempting to adhere to such an all-inclusive global approach to communications technology, the, mu the museum, not surprisingly, perhaps found itself straddling multiple spheres and interests. And we could say that this was perhaps too much for it in the end. Despite all of the positive feedback and promises made during the museum's planning phase, uh, the initial financial survey, the legislative approvals, granted permits, uh, Saul Lesser's receipt of a Humanitarian o Academy Award in 1961 for his museum activity, the significant attention and industry support for the 1963 groundbreaking that we saw before, and the supposed successful reception of this film concept within industry circles there were a confluence of factors that led to the museum's eventual downfall, many of which can be traced to the initial planning stages, if not earlier. So after more than 45 years, the question remains today, why don't we have a Hollywood Museum in Los Angeles? So what I'm going to do now is kind of briefly map out some of the historical reasons, many of which may still apply to the present day as well. By the mid-60s, ideological differences among civic agencies, the public, and the Hollywood industry reached a breaking point, swiftly eclipsing the museum planner's rhetoric about communication and this kind of unity. A notable schism between Hollywood and the Los Angeles founding fathers, the sort of downtown center of corporate elite and local politicians, developed as early as the 1920s. So this goes back before this museum project. Um, when the film industry actually first started to make its kind of economic marker contribution in the city. Most of the Hollywood Museum's problems were rooted, I would say, in this kind of early schism and played themselves out in a battle between public and private values and interests. Resentment toward the entertainment industry, often negatively identified as Jewish, liberal, communist, sympathizing, nouveau riche, etc., played itself out in a number of arenas as Hollywood's symbolic stature stood at odds with the everyday concrete political and social realities in Los Angeles as a city. Not to mention some of its representatives in the county and city offices. So among the county board of supervisors in particular, the museum had friends and foes, and one of the biggest foes was um, County Supervisor Kenneth Hahn. Competing visions about the ideal location for the museum, fundraising, which was a primary concern, and other responsibilities caused conflict between industry and county leaders. 
Bruce egos, mean spirit competition and resentment, meanwhile shaped much of the criticism that was leveled against the project. In addition to internal skirmishes between county and museum planners, certain unforeseen external factors also affected the museum's success. So during its lengthy planning phase, developments in the Los Angeles tourist industry, studio tours at um, Universal, which you see here, John Wayne just happens to go up to a tourist on the, on the tram. Um, studio tours at Universal, as well as review studios and MGM, uh, Movie Land Wax Museum, all of these things and, and others indirectly impacted the museum and the uniqueness of what it had planned as far as exhibition. But one of the biggest obstacles, and this is the sort of fun story in all of this, um, one of the biggest obstacles from a public relations standpoint came from a part-time actor and sometimes bartender at Barney's Beanery named <laughs> Stephen Anthony, who was not satisfied with the, albeit piddly, $11,000 court award that he received for his half interest in one of the condemned land parcels opposite the Hollywood Bowl. So he refused to vacate the premises. <laughs> And in February 1964, when a Los Angeles County Sheriff attempted to evict him, he barricaded himself in his house with a shotgun cradled on one arm, and there's this mythology that he had a baby on the other, which <laughs> I don't know if that was actually true. Um, he, had, he was armed with a carbine rifle, 300 rounds of ammunition, and he sustained this barricade for 10 weeks. <laughs> During the standoff, he was continually denied <coughs> petitions for hearings and appeals, but managed to gather support of several ex-Marines, young Republican groups, and others who identified with his anti-communist rhetoric and name-calling that was directed at the county. In April, after Anthony was arrested, and there's a great story about how that all went down, um, and his house was being raised, nearly 200 angry demonstrators battled with 100 police officers at the site. So this Anthony debacle, um, I think, quite clearly damaged the reputation and legitimacy <coughs> of the museum project for many people in the public, as well as those sitting on the county board, many of whom placed sole blame on the industry for the museum's problems. County leaders instituted probes of the museum's financing and questioned its actual dedication to the public. The sordid details of the museum's dissolution, meanwhile, played out regularly in the press. So local papers called the museum the Great What's It, a Taj Mahal, a White Elephant, a, a Boondoggle, a Peep Show, and a Tourist Trap. <coughs> Many of these labels ideologically, I would say, reverted back to the early days of cinema and framed Hollywood as foreign and its products as bad objects and vulgar entertainment. Seeing the museum solely as a vehicle for industry promotion and commerce, the ideals of global communication were reduced in the public eyes to a trick and drain on their municipal monies. Curator Arthur Knight, who actually taught at USC years ago, later espoused what is still a familiar refrain today. That is, Hollywood does not care about the past, or its own past, for that matter. And there is perhaps, we could say, some truth to this criticism. Aside from Lou Wasserman's alliance with Dorothy Chandler, the more recent contributions made by David Geffen, the Geffen Playhouse and the Geffen Contemporary at MoCA, the erection of downtown's Disney Hall, major civic responsibilities have typically been left in the hands of city, the city's government leaders um, and established philanthropists. So we want to consider that, but I also want to argue that the blame cannot reside with Hollywood alone. The often strained relationship between local industry, local politics, and established civic leaders, as well as the failed alliance between the county and Hollywood museum planners undoubtedly affected the industry's participation in this kind of civic project. After abandoning the project in 1965, the county paved the proposed site, which was subsequently used for overload Hollywood Bowl parking. <laughs> Meanwhile, the artifacts and films gathered dust behind chicken wire partitions in a warehouse in downtown Los Angeles as most of the donors had signed binding agreements that gave full rights of ownership to this non-existent museum. In January 1968, the city of Los Angeles' Department of Recreation and Parks 
purchased the artifacts, stones, and memorabilia for a mere $22,500, a sum that covered the museum's outstanding debt, but not necessarily the value of the artifacts. <laughs> Under the city's patronage, the collection remained indefinitely in storage at the downtown Lincoln Heights Jail. And there's a lot of other interesting stories, too, about one of the people from Recreation and Parks who was selling things off, you know, to go over with him into the jail and give him the right amount of cash. <laughs> While plans surfaced through the next decade for other commercial public partnerships, many of these proposals framed exhibition in the context of a decidedly post-classical nostalgia industry. Ironically, perhaps, many in the industry contested the prospect of commercializing their history and their artifacts and images. Various industry players expressed concern over these plans about their classiness and the legitimacy of the proposals. Concerns that indicated, again, this kind of ongoing preoccupation with self-image, as well as perhaps, and I would say this is also another facet we want to think about, a competitive, ego-driven battle between non-Hollywood real estate developers um, and the entertainment industry elite on the other side. Since the city hadn't come up with any viable options and further had been exposed, as I mentioned before, for this kind of mishandling of the collection, Mayor Tom Bradley approved and signed an agreement in 1981 to divide this massive collection of artifacts among four local institution that's institutions that had vested interests in Hollywood history and preservation. Each of the institutions, USC being one of them, as well as UCLA, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and AFI were given materials on a 25-year loan with the possibility of extension. So here at USC, we actually have in the Norris Theater, just right over there, this huge collection of artifacts in the basement that are just sitting there and occasionally get rotated and put on display, I think, in Doheny Library. Um, notable attempts to erect a museum still circulate. These are images of um, three kind of plans for museums built by the Motion Picture Academy. One from 1940 that was um, at the former site of the Trocadero nightclub. This more recent image on top of land that was purchased at the corner of Hollywood and Vine for several million dollars that had, has um, been dormant. And then these <coughs> newer plans to, to build a museum uh, at the former May Company. In 2006, though, when the Academy purchased this eight-acre land parcel near Sunset and Vine, they hired an architecture firm, um, but five years later, still had not raised the funds to actually build the museum. Recently, with the appointment of a new executive director at the Academy, they joined forces with LACMA. And so, they're apparently trying to kind of test the waters again on another county industry partnership on a decidedly smaller scale. This is obviously not eight acres um, the way this other land parcel is. The specter of past museum ventures, an overzealous purchase of property at the top of the market in 2006, the pitfalls of this kind of county partnership, and the industry's historical lack of generosity, though, still, I would say, hang over the Academy's plans. In the end, the Hollywood Museum, though, the historical one and maybe you know, those in the future, could not encompass the single vision that they planned. And as plans for the future, for a future museum remain up in the air, it seems prudent to consider the reasons, but also the alternate avenues devised for concretizing and memorializing Hollywood. As multinational conglomerates gradually enveloped Hollywood, um, the studios in the 1980s and 90s, Hollywood's symbolic, historical, and nostalgic image garnered increasing cachet and economic return outside of Hollywood and the borders of Los Angeles. While many still long for the return of Hollywood Boulevard as an entertainment and fantasy epicenter, it's clear that commercial interests increasingly harness Hollywood, the dream, outside the confines of its complicated Los Angeles reality. So the next question I'd like to ask and sort of conclude with is where is Hollywood and where can we find it? And here I'm just going to offer a kind of brief idea of other areas I cover in the book. So theme spaces like Planet Hollywood that try to capture a Hollywood experience through artifact display and making consumers feel like stars. So if you walk into this New York Planet Hollywood, all of these lights kind of flicker as if you are you know, a victim of the paparazzi. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
collectible artifacts that offer insight into backstage regions or appropriate and celebrate <laughs> Hollywood history. And I love these <laughs> classic films you can carry. So these purses that were a joint venture between El Portal Luggage and Turner Classic Movies. <laughs> the digital age, um, oh wait, I have one more slide here. The, the absolute rose, but these are actually, um, these were stamps produced by the US Postal Service. Uh, but I'd like to just kind of continue and wrap up talking about the digital age a little bit. So the digital age and the values associated with the new Hollywood <coughs> increasingly question, if not eradicate, the need to situate Hollywood history in a single physical site. And many of the physical monuments and sites dedicated to Hollywood that I discussed throughout the book have been rearticulated in the televisual and digital realm, broadening their scope and allowing, for example, 24-hour uh, access to the Hollywood sign by way of internet webcam, okay? So just in case you wanted to know what was going on up there. Um, an iPhone app with a virtual tour of the Walk of Fame. Um, and, and here we have also Deadline Hollywood, which is an internet site, but also um, an app where you can search all number of, you know, kind of statistics or, or facts about Hollywood as an industry. Yet, what I'd argue at the end here is that the meaning of Hollywood does not necessarily change in these sites, even though we're talking about the digital era. Even user-generated fan sites often work within many of the same sanctioned narratives and basic canonized histories of Hollywood. And this becomes even more the case as many of those most popular fan sites and blogs were taken over by conglomerates in the last 10 years. So IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes, and even Deadline Hollywood started off as fan sites or blogs. Like the Hollywood Museum venture, the internet has become another contested terrain where various sites, producers, and consumers wrestle really to control Hollywood's past, present, and future. And while the internet clearly represents a key site of our digital age, I'd also like to end by considering the way Hollywood also continually migrates back to older media sites Turner Classic Movies here, and in some cases, its original geographic locale. So Turner Classic Movies has, for the last couple years, um, instituted this film festival in Hollywood, and here it is at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. So examples such as this point to what I would say is a kind of cross-pollination of media and sites that not only exemplifies the synergistic motives of conglomerates, but also indicates Hollywood's continued ability to travel temporally and spatially. So the sites may change as technologies fluctuate and develop, but I'd argue that Hollywood will remain this constant site of fascination, memories, and dreams. Yeah, it's interesting in relation to the notion of convergence, which seemed to be predicted already in that earlier museum, Emerging in the areas of media. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, as you well know, we now have a television and radio museum in Beverly Hill. Mm -hmm. We have the Grammy Museum now in LA. And we actually do have a Hollywood studio museum. Right. It's exactly where that site was originally was part of that parking lot, but a much more humble oh, yes. site. Probably the, the size of this room. Real barn, yeah. which was the first studio yes. in Hollywood. But we now have this actually, this actually. Mm -hmm. it's and they would assume that the Hollywood Museum is going to propose would be more focused on motion pictures rather than the other things. Well, given the Academy's tendency to focus also on itself and, and exclusively on film, they're very particular about who can speak, you know, and television people, if, you know, can be someone who's actually had film roles, right, can be the host of the Academy Awards, so it can't be just a television figure. So they are very protective of that notion of Hollywood is something that but, but it is interesting to think about all of these other spaces. And one other space to throw in there that I find always fascinating because it's this combination of massive on these land in the middle of Hollywood and the apex of memorialization of the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Yes. And sort of how that, because I mean it's land that is of no sort of use except for the movie, the cinema space, sort of right. every summer becomes this like mecca of people coming and watching movies and because it's, it's like butted up against Paramount, it's really the sort of 
that awkward sort of notion of it's alive and it's dead. I like I have a relative buried there, so it's always really odd to go and like see who's there. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah. I have that because it's I mean it's a massive amount of land in the middle of Hollywood that they've turned into a place a prime space to see movies. Or right, summer. and I think I, I forgot the name of the the company or the family that bought it and kind of retooled it to make it more of a commercial space and brought cinema space in there, so that there is again that that kind of um, value of history, but also this commercial side that are kind of coming together there. Yeah. One thing that struck me was the that tension between magic and science that was in a lot of the earlier materials, and I wondered if you sense that there is a threat to the that balance in creating a museum that it might undo some of the magic by showing, you know, pulling away the curtain. And it seemed like some of the newer museums don't really showcase the science technology side of filmmaking mm -hmm. as much. Yeah. No, I think that's a really interesting question. And, and I think it's one that is, was a struggle through all of these historical attempts. You know, that part of the attraction is showing this behind the scenes, revealing what's behind the curtain. But then, you know, you also have to keep that spectacle going. So even on DVDs, I don't know how many people actually listen to the extra features on DVDs or play with them, but there's that same kind of balance, again, between the spectacle and the glamour of it all, and then, oh, we're going to show you exactly how we do this. And I think that is a tricky balance, but one that is really key to kind of defining, you know, Hollywood in this way. There's another uh, striking irony in that Anthony controversy, yeah. uh, with eviction and so on, because this was occurring almost at the same time that Dodger Stadium was mm -hmm. where people were being evicted, mm -hmm. and it was, it was constructed in spite of that. Right, and obviously was, the and class and race issues. Yeah, the communism and all that. Yeah, yeah. Clash. Racism and Clash What's the score for them like nowadays? What, what does the score card look like nowadays? What? Who's the one from 2012? What do you think is as upper hand? Who has the upper hand? The corporates or the creatives? Um, I I would always go with the corporate side, probably. <laughs> um, but maybe that's because I'm cynical. Um, I think you know, one of the interesting things about this Academy uh, venture with this new museum is that they you know, they spent all this money, they really invested in it, but they ha they didn't have quite enough. Uh, to actually put a museum together. And it's, it's just interesting because no matter how much they sort of sought that money from, from people in Hollywood, there wasn't money to, you know, to kind of get on that level. And so this kind of question of is Hollywood generous? What, will they give only to certain kinds of causes as opposed to others? And I think you know, all of these become interesting questions. To think about. How much of that is the studios in a sense, being competitive, and no one of them would benefit from it. So you know, they, they weren't interested in putting in something that would benefit, you know, any one of them. Directly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of like the tours, of course. Right, the tours are all individual, and I think that's again this kind of competition and, and this ego-driven kind of battle that that was going on. And I'm doing some other research right now, separately about. Um, Hollywood philanthropy and looking into also attempts within this is in the in the 1940s and 50s but attempts to kind of create this umbrella organization where all of Hollywood would contribute under one payroll pledge program but at the same time it was all about which studio is giving more um, as well as you know which kind of Hollywood player is giving more so the interesting thing tied to this perhaps is also that the executives and the, and the actors gave the least. The actual people that were in the unions, the labor, who gave the most to this payroll pledge system. Yeah. Um, the museum in Washington, D.C. is pretty spectacular and mm -hmm. pretty effective museum. Do you have any thoughts about why they were able to be successful in putting that together there and not here? Single company. What was that? It's a single company. A single company, yeah. 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 So yeah, I think that there, again, there's so many, it's hard when I'm asked why why didn't this succeed, why you know, can't it be like this museum or that museum, but I think it, it does come back to so many of these, these interlocking 
factors, but I think you know one maybe that, that Larry pointed to was the, the issue of ownership um, and control. The other um, <coughs> factor that just occurred to me when you were talking about the conflicting interests, you know, after the 1940s, but there is a conflict, you know, a kind of cliche conflict we say between the suits and the creatives. But yet, after the 1940s, a lot of the unions won a lot of residual rights for the creatives. So that, you know, um, unlike, let's say, traditional arts where the, a painter sells their work and the new owner owns that, um, the creatives that contribute to a movie still have an ownership stake um, and still have a right. So you were mentioning some of the conflicts um, with some of the egos, and it occurred to me things like, you know, Fred Astaire's estate. Remember when they sued the vacuum cleaner company? Yeah. So they have this enduring right. appeal and stake still. And I don't know if that plays a role in collection. Because yeah. for traditional arts, you can collect one individual and then donate it to the museum. Right, right. And I think some of the people that were the most sort of invested in keeping this dream going or in getting their artifacts back were all the people like the estates or people that had died. So it was Jesse Lasky's daughter, Betty Lasky, who actually was the one who called upon Mayor Bradley to get to take care of these artifacts and divide them into these four institutions. So I think the estates do be more important. Um, I'll go. Um, I, this just follows up from that, Tom, and Peter's question too. This this kind of difficulty about trying to predict if, if the museum would actually succeed now, um, especially in comparison to other museums now. I mean, I think alongside all the interlocking factors that you just um, so laid out here for us in terms of Hollywood, it also has to be put in the context of the commercialization of the museum industry. And so that that you know the, the early version with this epic vision wasn't competing with the Grammy Museum and the other kind of commercially driven museums and the whole model for museums now that is more and more about profit and less and less about this kind of uh, educational epic. Right. Um, you know, so so it actually I would say probably could succeed now in a way in, in that same in, in, in the, using that same kind of model in a way that it maybe couldn't mm -hmm. in 1960. Yeah, and I think going back to Kevin's question about the, the behind the scenes, I think museums not only have this, this stake in, in sort of the commercialization, but also there's this tendency in museums also to, since the 80s, kind of reveal what's going on behind the scenes and create a new kind of exhibit space that's more experiential, that's more, you know, touching buttons and, Those you know. 40 films and. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think in many other cities that there might have been a strong enough city initiative to push this through. Yeah. But this period of time in Los Angeles was a unique uh, time because of the conflict between the Board of Supervisors and the city leadership. And with the rapid suburbanization, the board of uh, the county board was much more sensitive to the needs of uh, new suburban development and resources moving in that area. So I think if, if one looks at that historically uh, significant period, it really helps explain the lack of public initiative. You know, most cities would have jumped at a chance to make a big tourist public kind of statement about a core industry, and it's a real failure of the political imagination. I think that this city. Well, and it was extremely divisive. I mean, they're literally, from what I imagine in my head, you know, Kenneth Hahn on one side and this other Ernest Gibbs, you know, the friend, the foe, and really battling. And I think uh -huh. Kenneth Hahn just was louder and, and very brasher. Weak, very weak mayor here, so yeah. that there's nobody to counter the power of the supervisors. Yeah. Make one last comment. You deal in the book at all with this more recent controversy surrounding the Hollywood sign and the preservation of the Hollywood sign or the pristine backdrop of the Hollywood sign and the development that was proposed next door to Hollywood. There was no competition. They all got behind the Hollywood sign. Right. Generic. Right, right. Um, no, partly because our colleague, Neil Brody, um, wrote a book on that. <laughs> <laughs> I decided that that you know, didn't need as much attention, but I do, I do, you know, Allude to it here and there. Smart idea. We're <laughs> glad you wrote about what you wrote about. Okay. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, next week we have Miriam Metzger from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and an Hamburg alum. Uh, the topic of her talk is latent social interaction actions in social networking sites.
And the week after that, which is our last week of the semester, is Janice Radway from Northwestern. Her topic <coughs> is Girls, Zines, and the 1990s. So those will be our last two and the research seminars from the year.